So we're just a few minutes uh, away from starting. Uh, they're finishing up some uh, preliminary things, and uh, they'll be in here very, very soon. And uh, I thought when I walked in that it was Rosh Hashanah, but I, I maybe at the wrong time of year. So uh, let's let's sing a few songs till the program gets started. You sing with me. Hine matovum anayim shevet achim gam yachad. Hine matovum anayim shevet achim gam yachad. Hine matov shevet achim gam yachad. Hine matov shevet achim Kam yachad, hine matov manayim, shevet achim kam yachad, hine matov manayim, shevet achim kam yachad. Ose shalom imromav, uyase shalom aleinu. They are called Israel. They imru, imru, amen. Oh, shalom, imromav. Uya, say, shalom, aleinu. They are called Israel. They imru, imru, amen. Ya ase shalom, ya ase shalom, shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael. Ya ase shalom, ya ase shalom, shalom aleinu v'yako Yisrael. V'imeru, amen. The program is going to begin. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, little, okay, here we go. Um, we're going to bring <clears throat> Ambassador Ross and the rabbi up first. Um, and then <clears throat> Rami Abad is going to say a few words. I'll come back to kick it off. Uh, and then uh, we'll have the rabbi and uh, the ambassador have a nice uh, conversation. Okay, Rami, you want to come up? Thank you. Bukhim Abayim, Shalom Aleichem, a big hello, a big hello to everyone uh, for coming to our inaugural Woodbury Jewish Center Education Series. Uh, you should save your programs and your, your uh, ticket stubs. Keep it with your Mickey Mantle 1956 uh, baseball card. It's probably going to be worth a lot of money one day. We recently had an event a few months ago, and the same, the same phrase applies now, and that is, Hine maitovu manayim, shevet achim gam yachad. How pleasant it is to be with brethren, to dwell together tonight. It's really, it's really heartwarming to see so many People from all over Long Island, so many synagogues from all over Long Island here tonight. We have uh, clergy from all over uh, Long Island from the different shuls. We have board members from different shuls over here. Um, to see the support from some of the uh, Jewish organizations in the area, JNF, Israel Bonds, uh, Salman Schechter School of Long Island has a lot of representation here today. It really makes it feel like Kulanu Mishpacha, like we're one big family. A few months ago, when the position of an adult education on the board of directors of Woodbury Jewish Center was, was taken on by Rob Dweck, uh, sitting with a few of the other board members, and we were saying, I wonder what that role is going to be like. Is, it, is he going to teach us how to count to 10 in Hebrew? Is he going to 
Is he going to teach us uh, the alphabet, alphabet, gimel, dalid? <laughs> Little did we know that uh, Rob was going to think incredibly big and come up with uh, the idea, the vision of a uh, program like this. And we're really honored to have uh, such a great uh, speaker here tonight, such a great program. So uh, Rob and Alyssa Dweck, the uh, architects of this evening, want to give you a hand. And um, <laughs> call a kabod to you guys. And uh, the mic is yours. So I'm, I'm just going to take a few minutes and, uh, and kick us off. Um, so good evening, and uh, as Rami mentioned, um, we'd like to welcome everybody. Perfect timing uh, for the fire engine. Um, uh, welcome to the inaugural uh, Mail-In Family Lecture Series feature featuring Ambassador Ross. Um, it's an honor to have uh, so many synagogues and uh, organizations represented here. Um, and I hope it's just the beginning of our shared community-based uh, programming. Um, so about, I don't know if it was about 10 years ago, there must be quite a fire on this one, but about 10 years ago, um, I saw Ambassador Ross <clears throat> um, at the 92nd Street Y with Alan Dershowitz. And he was being interviewed, they were both being interviewed based on books they had just written um, by a journalist who was very competent and, uh, and engaging. Um, and uh, as I'm sure we all know, uh, Alan Dershowitz can be a little bombastic, which um, uh, is part of you know, why he's so enjoyable. Um, um, so as the event marched along, uh, Dershowitz started to take over, um, but not in the way that you think. He started to turn and ask the ambassador all the questions. Um, and it was so clear that he was as enthralled with the ambassador, although they know each other for a long time, um, as the journalist was. Um, and watching that was uh, so impressive that when this opportunity came up, uh, uh, the first person I thought of uh, to have speak with us uh, was and is Ambassador Dennis Ross. Um, so I just want to thank some people and, and uh, come back and give you uh, a sense of um, uh, what the ambassador uh, has done. Um, so I'd like to express our sincerest gratitude to Amir Malin uh, for his generous sponsorship of this uh, lecture series. Um, additionally, uh, Richard Sepler, uh, who uh, is on the board of the Nancy Friday Foundation, um, brought uh, them in as a co-sponsor. Um, so we've got We've got some real traction and, um, and are, uh, are making the, the very best of it. So thank you uh, to both uh, Amir and Richard for your generous um, contributions. Um, I'd also like to thank the core group of people who have helped put this together. Um, as most of you know, <clears throat> it takes a big effort um, and those people deserve uh, thank yous. I, I don't know how many are in here, but I'm just going to tell you who they are and, uh, and we'll thank them afterwards if they're not in here. So M Michelle Kamatsu, uh, Charlene Levy, uh, Courtney Plush, uh, my lovely wife who is here somewhere. Um, they have uh, put uh, an incredible amount of effort into this. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, the president of Woodbury Jewish Center, Paul Chasquez, uh, and of course, our wonderful rabbi, who you'll be hearing from quite a bit in, in a few moments. Finally, uh, I want to acknowledge Cantor Cohen, uh, whose support and assistance have been pivotal uh, in bringing elements of this event together. Thank you, Cantor. 
Um, before I get to the ambassador's introduction, um, just a few sort of pieces of business. Um, most of you will have received cards uh, to fill out the questions. Uh, my boys, Ben and Ollie, will come around and pick them up. <clears throat> I'll sort through them, and then um, uh, at the time of the Q&A, uh, I will uh, ask the ambassador uh, the questions, and, uh, and the rabbi will give me a hand on that. Um, following the Q&A, the ambassador has been ger generous enough to um, sign books that are available for purchase uh, out in the main area. Um, so I strongly encourage people to read uh, Doomed to Succeed. Uh, I've read it. It is it's incredible. Uh, more importantly, it's as relevant today as it, as it ever was. Um, so finally, uh, I'd like to introduce our distinguished guest, Ambassador Dennis Ross. Um, Ambassador Ross is a true luminary in the field of diplomacy, renowned for his profound understanding of the Middle East and his tireless efforts towards peace and stability in the region. Throughout his illustrious career, Ambassador Ross has been an instrumental force in shaping international relations. From his role as Director of Policy, planning in the State Department under President George H.W. Bush, where he played a crucial part in the historic Madrid Peace Conference, to his pivotal contributions during President Bill Clinton's administration as the U.S. point person on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Ambassador Ross has consistently demonstrated an unwavering commitment to diplomacy and reconciliation. Currently, he is counselor and William Davidson fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and teaches at Georgetown University's Center for Jewish Civilization. Thank you, Ambassador, for coming. Uh, before we start the program, uh, I kindly ask everyone to rise as the cantor will take the stage and perform the, perform the Star Spangled, Spangled Banner and Hatikva. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the hope of the brave. Call the whole name of Penema, Nefesh Yehudi, O Mia, Ulefate Mizrach, Kadima. I in let Sion Sophia Oh love da tigavate nu Ha tigavabach no dale paim Leo damechov shi Mayaretse nu the Eretz Sion, Yerushalayim, Liot Amechov Shi, Mayaretz Sainu, the Eretz Sion, Yerushalayim. Um, 
I just want to say one thing before we start, and that is to thank the officers from the seventh, uh, from the second precinct, who have come uh, to support the community. Uh, so thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah. All right, so first, I want to say you obviously have my respect for your long and lasting um, bio alone, um, but you, you claimed into my heart a few moments ago when I said, oh, did you eat enough? Do you want more food? And you said, don't worry, I'll eat again when we're done. <laughs> uh, I want to begin in a totally different direction than I planned on based on something you said to me in the hallway. You said that you were speaking at another campus last night, yeah. and that a uh, Palestinian student got up and gave you a hard time basically saying... You know, the entire concept of Israel is a colonial state. Yeah. We've uh, had this at our own local school district as a claim from some of our parents. And so give us some tools. What do you say in response to that question? Uh, first, I'm glad you, you asked because it is, this has kind of taken on a life of its own. Uh, and it's, it, couldn't be, it, it couldn't be more wrong. Now, why do, why do I say that? One, there was always a historic Jewish connection to the land, always. Um, two, there was always a small Jewish presence, even after the destruction of the Second Temple, throughout really the, the millennium since then, there was always a small Jewish presence. Three, I don't need to tell you what the prayer is at the end of Yom Kippur or at the end of the Seder next year in Jerusalem. Five, this was not, what are colonies? Who had colonies? Empires. Empires had colonies. This was not an empire. Who went to Palestine? Who were the Zionists? They're all fleeing where they lived. You know, Leo Pinsker, who was one of the Zionist philosophers from Russia, actually a doctor, he described the Jews as being a ghost people because he said they lived on the fringes of society. They had no standing anywhere. And Herzl, who wasn't steeped in the religion, uh, who wasn't even fully aware of what was going on in Russia and Eastern Europe and the pogroms, but he was heavily influenced uh, by what he by the Dreyfus Affair. Uh, and he had come to the conclusion there was no way the Jews could live, even in the so-called places that were enlightened, like France. So who goes? These are people, basically, who are refugees. And by the way, more than half the population in Israel today, probably 60%, are Jews who come from the Arab world. They were forced to go with nothing. It wasn't like they had a choice. They were forced to go with nothing. You know, when Golda Meir, the thing that, that if, what, what made Biden such a strong supporter of Israel? This is a story he tells over and over and over again, which is just a reflection of how much it affected him. He's a 29-year-old senator. He's there in 1973, and he asked Golda Meir, uh, I don't know, given everything you're facing, all the threats, how do you sleep at night? She said, we have a secret weapon we have no place else to go. The anti-Zionists want to say everybody came from someplace else. Well, first of all, most of the people who, the vast majority of people who live in Israel today, guess where they were born? They were born in Israel. This is not a colonial state. This is not a settler state. This is a, this is a nation state of the Jewish people. If you say this is a colonial state, what you're trying to say is the Jews have no right to be there. What you're also saying is the Jews are not a people, and therefore they don't have a right to self-determination. So the way you take this on, I just describe this in pretty straightforward, simple terms. This is not, it doesn't take a big treatise. It's a very straightforward set of points, and the simplest of them is the people who went there, they had no place else to go. Thank you so much. Uh, along, 
you know, pivoting to a little more of what's going on at this exact moment, the news has all over the place, again, the two-state solution yeah. as uh, the, the solution for this moment. Uh, is there really, A, is it really feasible? Is, is there a partner for this to create? Is, that, is there a version of a secure Israel that also has uh, a, another state of Palestinians alongside it? Look, as, as complicated as it is, you have two national movements competing for the same space. You have new, two national identities. In one state, inevitably, they're not going to coexist. If you look at the rest of the region, every single place where you have more than one national identity, sectarian identity, or tribal identity, you have a state that's either at war with itself or completely paralyzed. So you look at Libya, you look at Lebanon, you look at Syria, you look at Yemen, you even look at Iraq. Uh, these are all places where you have more than one identity. In the Middle East, uh, coexistence doesn't seem to work real well, at least internally within states. So two national identities, they're not going to coexist in one state. Uh, now, can you provide, can you produce a second state? And the answer is, not soon. But what is needed is two states for two peoples. By the way, what I just said, that formula, two states for two peoples, that's the formula you should be hearing. Don't talk about the two-state solution, because there are a lot of Palestinians for whom two states means a Palestinian state and a binational state. Uh, oftentimes, one of the arguments has been, well, the Jews are a religion, they're not a people. No, the Jews are a people, and they have a right self-determination, and they've built a state, that's the point. So two states for two peoples. Now, can it be achieved soon? No, it can't be achieved soon. But it does mean those within Israel who want to prevent a second state are going to produce a one-state outcome. Uh, and Israel can be Jewish or democratic, or it can be a Jewish democracy, but in one state it's going to be hard to be a Jewish democracy if the numbers don't permit that. So how do you bridge what I just said? That on the one hand, you ultimately have to have something that other than one state because that's a prescription for endless conflict. Yet on the other hand, if you had a Palestinian state today, it would be a failed state. And we don't need one more failed state in the Middle East. If you're sitting in Israel today, left to right, this is not just Bibi Netanyahu, it's not just Ben Gavir and Smotrich. This is the entire body politic. They don't want to hear the term Palestinian state. They don't want to hear the term Palestinian state because they think it will be run by Hamas. So if you're going to have a Palestinian state, it's going to have to emerge only after a period of time, and there's going to have to be a series of benchmarks of performance that have to be met before you have a Palestinian state. I was sitting, I mean, I went to, I was telling you, I was in Israel from... Um, December 10th to January 5th, I went there from the UAE, and I had, a couple weeks earlier, I had been in Saudi Arabia. So I've been in the Arab world in Israel since uh, October 7th. And I said to the Saudis, because they said, look, we, if you're, in, if you're in the Arab countries right now, and we can speak more about this, if you're in the Arab countries right now, the only thing you're seeing on the Arab satellite television networks, and I, I do at least two interviews on these networks a, a week, uh, the only thing you see are the images in Gaza, and they're awful. If you were watching them, that's all you watched, you'd be affected by it. So all the leaderships, they're on the defensive. They want a ceasefire now. Ask them at the same time, you want Hamas to reemerge? The answer is no. We want Hamas to lose, and we want it over now. I understand the desire, but it's a magical solution. It's not possible right now. If you're going to have a second state, a Palestinian state, what is required? And I said to them, let me ask you a question. You want a state that's run by Hamas? Oh, no. You want a state that could become part of the axis of resistance, what the Iranians call the axis of resistance? I actually, I call it the axis of misery, because actually every state that's part of it is a collapsing state. And by the way, to show you how well things are going for the Iranians, you know, they, they play up the idea of elections 
You know what the turnout was for the, in Tehran for this election after the Supreme Leader uh, campaigned on you have to go out and vote? And if you don't vote, you're, it's a threat to our national security? 11%. Not exactly a vote of confidence. Anyway, I say you want a Palestinian state to be a member of the axis of resistance? No way. You want a Palestinian state to be a source of instability in the region? No way. You want a Palestinian state that lacks the institutions, which it does, the Palestinian Authority does today, uh, so that it will be a failed state? No way. So I said, so let's agree on what are the kind of benchmarks that have to be achieved that everyone can see that this is a state that not only would be a sustainable state, but it'll be a state that contributes to peace and coexistence, is not a threat to it. So in, I, I will still talk about two states for two peoples because one state for me is the end of, of Zionism and what it was meant to be. But two states for two peoples also can only evolve over a period of time and there has to be, there can't be an automaticity to this. So let's say Saudi, UAE, they come together, they, they go to you, you set the benchmarks because we yeah. trust you, you're yeah. the guy. Uh, is there someone, is there any group of people from the Palestinians to take, the, to take their leadership? Can you give us some names? Look, there are people, uh, but I think I can give you names. We'll write them down. You can write them down. No, look, there, the, the problem is it's not individuals right now. There needs to be a generational change on the Palestinian side. Um, look, in 2007, there was an, um, the, the, the Bush administration organized all the donors, went to Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, the president of the PA, and said, we will cut you off unless you appoint Salam Fayyad as an empowered prime minister. So he did, and he cleaned things up. Now, after five years, he was forced out because he made lots of enemies because he cleaned things up. There are people like that. There's, uh, there's a guy named Bashar al-Masri. He's built a, a city from the ground up called Rawabi. It's about 10 minutes from, uh, from Ramallah. Uh, I say that every Israeli should see it. Because if you saw it, you'd realize you'd have a very different view of the Palestinians. Uh, one of Marwan Barghouti's sons was one of the people who was uh, you know, a 30-something, one of the guys helping to develop. And I asked him, who's not Marwan Barghouti, who's in jail, it was his, one of his sons. And, and I asked him, I said, so why are you doing this? And he says, because I want my son to have a future. There are people like that. I had a, a Zoom this past week uh, with a, a guy who's in his 30s, who spends half the year in, uh, in Geneva working for uh, an institute, and then the other half where he's from, which is Hebron. Uh, and I met him, I met him actually in the UAE, uh, and, and he, wanted to, he wanted to follow up with a Zoom meeting afterwards. And, and one of his questions to me was, what's your advice to me about how I can affect things politically here? Uh, and he said, because I don't just speak for myself. And I said, well, first of all, if we can't succeed in recreating the approach on reform that was done in 2007, don't waste your time, because it's a closed system right now. Uh, but that closed system in the, in the West Bank, the PA, 91% of the Palestinians in the West Bank want Abu Mazen to resign. 80% believe that the Palestinian Authority is corrupt. Uh, so you have to get reform. You have to produce reform and once there's reform, there has to, part of the reform has to be creating openings for a younger generation to come in and help run the administration. Palestinians, by the way, are an extremely talented people. They have the most, on a per capita basis, they have the most uh, highest number of advanced degrees of anybody in the Arab world on a per capita basis. Everywhere they, everywhere they are in their diaspora, they're successful. So, it's not that they aren't talented, and it's not that they, you know, that they can't, in the end, build what could be a very successful state. It's that they've never had a leadership that makes it possible. Okay, we're putting you in charge. Thank you very much for solving that problem for us.
Uh, let's zoom out slightly. We, as you mentioned before, there is uh, obviously, uh, he's got to get closer to the microphone. You mean you want to hear me too? Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, the um, zoom out. So obviously this is part of a larger region. And in particular, we hear a lot about Sunni and Shia Muslims. Can you talk about how that dynamic conflict, whatever word you want to choose, is playing out in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Yeah, I would, uh, let me put it this way. The, the notion of Shia-Sunni Shia conflict, I mean, it's been there, but I think to put it in the proper perspective, this is about Iran. This is about Iran with proxies. And by the way, one of its proxies is Hamas, which is Sunni. So it's not, I think we have to get beyond this schism. There is a schism, but I think you have to look at it through the lens of what Iran represents in the region. And Iran has created, excuse me, a network of proxies. Uh, and these proxies basically, they do, most of them do Iran's bidding. Uh, and, and what does Iran want to do? Iran wants to dominate the region. First part of it is a kind of traditional Persian nationalism, where they think they look down on the Arabs, they think they have a right to dominate the region. Part of it is their, the ideology of the Islamic Republic. Uh, they define, to give you an example, they look at Hezbollah and their position in Lebanon and in Syria, they describe it as for defense. You know, this is their defense perimeter. It's like, you know, the, the old Soviet Union and, and even Russia now with Putin used to look at what their border was and they would always say, because of threats, we have to push it out. And of course, I once, when in the, in the old days before Gorbachev, well, actually during in an ac academic exchange I had in the mid-1980s, um, I was hearing this from a, from a Soviet and and he said, look at these threats we have. And I said to him, you know, you think it's an accident that you have a problem with people on your border? How do you treat all of your neighbors? You know, this is, Iran is basically the same. They, they dominate Syria. They dominate Lebanon. I, it's a, I'm sorry about that. It's a, Happens frequently, by the way. Uh, so it, you know, all the Yemen the, with the Houthis, I mean, these are, these are all groups that are mostly instruments of Iran, not entirely. They have some of their own interests as well. But Iran looks at them as a vehicle of intimidation and coercion. Now, they look at them differently as it relates to Israel. Now, I, one of the keys is to understand the pursuit of the Iranian nuclear program. At this point, it's, it's a threshold nuclear weapon state. It doesn't have weapons, but it is accumulating fissionable material that's very close to weapons grade. Now, that doesn't make a weapon. You still have to take the fissionable material and turn it into a weapon. But you don't accumulate near weapons grade uh, fissionable material when it's enriched to that level, it has no civilian utility, no civilian purpose. If you want to use it for fuel, you enrich to 5%. Weapons grade is 90%. They've been enriching to 60%. There's no civilian purpose for that. So it's clearly creating a kind of option. And the key for them when it comes to Israel, do they want a nuclear weapon so they can drop it on Israel? No, because if they do it, they know they're going to get nuclear weapons dropped on them. What they want to do is they want to make Israel unlivable. And they want to make it unlivable by using these proxies. Look at where Israel is today. Israel has Gaza. It has the northern border with Hezbollah, which at this point is not an all-out war, but it's a daily war within a confined geographic space. Uh, it has threats from the Golan Heights and from Syria. It has threats from Iraq. And there was recently a drone launched from Iraq. Uh, it has the Red Sea in Yemen. So it has all these multiple fronts, and it's acting against all of them. You need a strategy to counter 
what are these proxies and the way Iran is using it. You have to raise the price to Iran for using the proxies. By the way, the Iranians will fight to the last of their proxies with one exception. They view them as completely expendable except for Hezbollah. Hezbollah is the only place where they have successfully exported the Islamic Revolution. And Hezbollah is like the equivalent of their foreign legion. They're the ones who were the stormtroopers uh, in Syria. You know, the Russians came in, they bombed. But what they, went, what, they weren't doing it on the ground, it was the Hezbollah was doing it on the ground. Uh, they're the ones who train the Houthis, Hamas. Each of them now has indigenous production capabilities. It was Hezbollah that went in and set those up and taught them how to use them. They create, they, you know, they produce their own drones now. It was Hezbollah and the Quds Force of the Revolutionary Guard, but it was mostly Hezbollah. And if that wasn't enough for Iran, they have 150,000 rockets. And the reason they have 150,000 rockets is because they are the deterrent of Israel hitting Iran's nuclear infrastructure. The Iranians have spent 40 years developing a nuclear infrastructure. They spent hundreds of billions of dollars on it. And for them, Hezbollah is the deterrent. You hit the, the Iranian nuclear infrastructure, 150,000 rockets. And what I was saying before uh, we came in here, Israel is deceptively normal today. If you're not in the northern part of the country, in the southern part of the country, life seems normal. It's deceptive because everybody has this collective sense of loss. It's deceptive because the pictures of the hostages are everywhere. It's deceptive because there is clearly a loss of a sense of security. But on the surface, there's a sense of normality. In the south and the north, there is not. You have a war with Hezbollah, there'll be no normal. Israelis will be in shelters for a month. Now, it doesn't mean there'll be much left of Lebanon. And it doesn't mean there'll be much left of Hezbollah. The price will be very high to Israel, but Hezbollah holds back because it understands Hezbollah has turned Lebanon into a failed state. This is a country that used to have a, a real middle class and was very resilient. Today, 80% of the country is impoverished. That's thanks to Hezbollah. So they understand they have Druze opposition, Christian opposition, Sunni opposition. They're not keen to get into a war with Israel. On the other hand, when you're exchanging fire every day uh, and you hit the wrong target, you can be off the races whether you want to be it or not. So let's push that one step farther. That's obviously, that's sort of the boogeyman right behind everything else, is where, what is tomorrow? Do we think that this day-to-day -day war is going to just keep going indefinitely? Is there a pause, a stop? What's going, where are we headed? Starting in Gaza, you mean? You want me to the north, too? In the north, too. In particular, with, I'd love to know more for sure about Gaza right now, since you brought up Hezbollah in the north. Yeah. Well, there's a relationship, because Nasrallah says, the head of Hezbollah, Nasrallah says they will continue doing this until there's a ceasefire. When there was a pause the first time that went on for eight days, they stopped. So there is a relationship. And partly, this is, this is the ladder for him to climb down. He's carrying out daily strikes into Israel, and Israel is retaliating. Uh, and he's doing it because he says, okay, we're, we're tying down the Israeli forces in the north by doing this. And they, they, so they can't be diverted to the south. Now, that's a nice argument for him. It's a nice, useful pretext. You know, Israel had five and a half divisions in Gaza. It now has five brigades. So it's, it, the, its presence has been dramatically reduced in Gaza. It's not like you know, there would be these forces in the north are going to go back into Gaza because Israel is in a different stage of its military campaign. But it suits Nasrallah's purpose to say we're tying down the forces because it also gives him an excuse not to have to do more. And he doesn't want to do more for the reasons I said. But I also said, you know, look, just in the past week, you know, they, yesterday they hit Kirat Shmona with, with 30 rockets. The Israelis have killed, look, the Israelis have killed a couple hundred of the, Hama, the Hezbollah fighters uh, and some of the most important commanders in the south and people quite close to Nasrallah. And after that's happened, uh, then 
Nasrallah you know, has a barrage of rockets that goes into Israel. Uh, for the most part, they, he continues to attack only military targets, not civilian ones. And there's been a few civilians who have been killed, but it's primarily they're hitting military targets. And when, they, when they have a barrage, then the Israelis respond. Uh, you know, last week the Israelis hit up in Baalbek, which is about 60 miles north of the border. That's well outside the bounds, the geographic bounds that the two sides had been respecting. So Nasrallah ratchets up, and then Israel shows, okay, when you ratchet it up, the price is going to be high. And there's a risk that is associated with that. So Israel's trying to say, it's trying to deter these kinds of strikes. Uh, but, you know, you can hit the wrong target. That's what I mean. I put, before, at the beginning of this, I said there was about a 25% chance that we'd see an all-out war between Lebanon and Israel. Net right now, because the, the, there's been a ratcheting up of the targets that are being hit, I put that as between 30 and 35 percent. Still uh, less likely than likely. But when you're dealing with the prospect of war, that doesn't leave me feeling real comfortable. Yeah. So let's zero in on Gaza. Yeah. Uh, let's start with the end and work back to the beginning, which is, is there an end? Do we think... You know, Ramadan's next week. Is there any possibility of this deal? I'm not sure that we're going to see a deal by Ramadan. Uh, clearly, the, the administration, the president, wants it badly. Uh, and, and for good reasons. I mean, if you, if you get a... There, there's the deal, that, the proposal that's been on the table talked about three phases. What looked to be a Hamas move was... They were saying, okay, in the first phase, which 40, each of these three phases would be 45 days. In the first phase, they were saying there doesn't have to be an end of the conflict. We'll only, dis we'll only discuss that in phase two. And, they were, and the, the basic deal that was being discussed was uh, you release a hostage for every day of the, of the pause. So they were talking about 40. Now, 40 included... Uh, all the women, including the women soldiers. It included the elderly and the sick and anyone who was under 19. Uh, the, and the, the reason it was more than 40 days is because they said, okay, you, a week to start this and then a day. So we're really talking about, was, it's probably 47 days. Um, there does seem to be some dissonance on the Hamas side between the outside political leaders, people like Ishmael Hania and Yahya Sinwar, who is the head of the Izzadi al Qassam Brigades, who is really the guy running Gaza and, and is the guy responsible for October 7th. Uh, he seems to be holding out. And I think the reason he's holding out, and it's worth sort of explaining this in some detail, when he was responsible for this, it was his decision. In fact, there are stories out now that the political leadership of Hamas weren't told by him, uh, which is believable to me. Uh, he's, you know, he lives in a small circle of conspiracy, but also he's a master of disinformation. I mean, he carried out, what they carried out was a, ca a campaign of deception, and the Israelis basically bought it because they had a set of assumptions about him. They felt he'd been in Israeli he'd been in Israeli prisons for 23 years. He happens to be fluent in Hebrew, pays a lot of attention, did pay a lot of attention to the Israeli media. Was clearly paying attention to the upheaval over the judicial reform or overhaul. Uh, but he was portrayed to me by the senior military and intelligence people as uh, someone the Israelis understood because he had a prisoner's mentality. And what they meant by that was those Palestinian prisoners will try to ratchet up pressure to get some kind of reward. And that's the way they read him. And he played into it. And that's what contributed to October 7th. So what were his assumptions? What were his assumptions? His assumptions were when, he, when they carried out this, that Hezbollah would launch an all-out war against Israel. You know, you're hitting Israel with, they have 150,000 rockets. They could hit Israel with three to 4,000 rockets a day at least 75,000 of those rockets, at least half of those rockets can cover most of Israel. Uh, you know, at least 50,000 have a lot of payload. 
they would, they would saturate uh, the whole Israeli. It's not you hear Iron Dome, but they'd saturate Iron Dome, uh, David Sling, the Arrow, uh, which would require the Israelis to go, in, go into Lebanon. There'd be no alternative. So he anticipated that. He thought there would be an explosion in the West Bank in response. And he thought the Israeli Arabs would rise up. He really saw this as a potentially a decisive turning point in terms of an unprecedented defeat of Israel. That's what he saw. Now, everything he assumed is one, one other thing he assumed. Understand that he was released in 2011 as part of the deal to get Gilad Shalit. 1,026 Palestinian prisoners were released to get Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier who had been kidnapped. And he was one of those. So, you know, it probably wasn't such a leap for him to think if we take a couple hundred hostages, that will deter the Israelis from coming in. Okay, they'll bomb us, but we're in the tunnels. And if they kill a lot of Palestinians, great, because it turns the world against Israel. And we're in these deep underground tunnels, the bombs don't affect us, uh, and they won't come in on the ground because they'll be threatening the lives of their hostages. So he made a series of miscalculations. And now he knows that Israel is actually, and I'm gonna, I, wanna, I wanna explain this in a second, Israel, if you define victory a certain way, not the way Bibi is defining it right now, um, Israel's not that far from it. Meaning if you define the objective as the demilitarization of Gaza, Israel is demilitarizing Gaza right now. When, when Bibi says we're going to have total victory, no, you're not going to have total victory because you're not going to eliminate every Hamas. You're not going to eliminate every Hamas with a gun. Why do we have 3,000 troops in Iraq right now? Why do we have 900 in Syria? We defeated ISIS. But this is an ideology. You don't militarily defeat an ideology. So define an objective you can achieve, because then you win. Define an objective you can't achieve, then it looks like you failed. So he, right now, realizes things ain't going well from his standpoint. By the way, it, it seems the external Hamas want to do the ceasefire deal, or mean the six-week deal. They're willing to accept, let's just accept the 45 days, or 47 days. He, I think, is banking on the fact, okay, I was wrong up until now, but Ramadan, this is you, you know, you fast from, from, from dawn to sunset. You spend the day in reflection. This is a in, highly intense religious experience. And the, the deeper, the more emotional the religious experience, the greater the potential for an explosion if the Israelis do something like on Jerusalem. You know, Ben Gavir wanted to limit prayer. Uh, really a smart thing, right? Let's limit access. Israel's always been known. What have they been known for? They provide freedom of access for religious sites because they're different than others. <laughs> and, and what does Ben Gavir want to do during Ramadan? He wants to limit Arab and Palestinian, Israeli Arab and Palestinian access to the Oscar Mosque and Haram al Sharif. Uh, you know, you want to create, talk about, you want to create an explosion? That'll create an explosion. It won't just be Palestinians, by the way. Uh, so this is, he is, he, Sinwar, is counting on, you know, having an explosion in Ramadan and that this will basically rescue him. Now, does that mean for all of Ramadan, he'll hold back? Could be that he wants to see what happens, say, the first week of Ramadan. And if nothing happens, then maybe, maybe he accepts it. I, I have also felt, if he was really, if the noose was really tightening around him right now, he would have more of an interest in a reprieve, which, uh, you know, which a six-week uh, pause would do. So I'm not sure the noose is tightening around him right now. Although, look, he is a master of disinformation and deception, so I, I'm not sure. Okay, so if I take my Apple news feed as gospel, then uh, Israel, the IDF is regular. Do I use this? Do I use this? Let's try. Hello? All right, we'll give this one a shot. If, yeah, if not, yes, I will, but thank you. We want to keep your mouth as close to the microphone as possible. Okay. <laughs> the, if I watch the news feed, then the, is, the IDF is committing regular war crimes, if not genocide, is 
denying food to hungry Gazans is causing a humanitarian crisis. How true? Is it true? Is there any truth? And what could we say in response if it's not true? All right, so let's, let's divide what's true and what's not true. What's not true is genocide. Genocide is the, the definition of genocide is the deliberate goal of eliminating a people or a group. If Israel was trying to eliminate all Palestinians, they wouldn't drop leaflets to have people evacuate. If Israel was trying to eliminate all Palestinians, they would not have created safe passage areas in Gaza. Israel is not trying to eradicate the Palestinian people. That's what genocide is. Uh, and so the, it really, it's, a, it's outrageous because it cheapens the term. You use it and you, you basically are denying, you're devaluing the meaning of the term. Now, is there a humanitarian crisis in Gaza? Yes, there is. Are there people actually really suffering from starvation? Yes, there is. Uh, could the Israelis be doing much more on the issue of humanitarian assistance? Yes, they could. Is Hamas diverting some of the humanitarian assistance that's going in? Yes, they are. This is like a rapid fire round, you know. It's a, yeah. Uh, so, what's the? Why are we seeing the problem that we're seeing? Part of it again goes back to the body politic in Israel. There is this collective sense of. Uh, you know, not only the collective sense of loss, but a collective sense we have to do something about the hostages. How can we be giving humanitarian assistance to them that, that Hamas is diverting, at least in part, and they're holding the hostages? One of the, we're dealing with two different universes right now. In Israel, the collective sense of loss is so powerful, the sense of trauma is so great there is an inability to relate to what's happening on the ground in Gaza to Palestinians. First of all, if you're there in Israel, just as I was, I was saying, if you, if you see Arab satellite television, all you see are the images of what's happening in Gaza, and there's nothing about October 7th. If you're in Israel, there are no images of what's happening in Gaza. It's just not in any of the media. You'll see pictures of fallen soldiers, but you don't see any of the suffering. It's like, because of the trauma, they can't absorb it. So there's pressure from the public not to provide humanitarian assistance. Now, it's been, it's been wrong-headed of the leadership to go along with the pressure. As understandable as the pressure might be, because those images are the reason that Israel is losing the information war. And those images put a lot of pressure on the United States. You have a Biden administration, he has vetoed three Security Council resolutions at no small price. Uh, those images feed that impulse, ceasefire now, because those images. The, the objective that Israel should have had all along was to buy the time and space it needed to demilitarize Gaza. And they are succeeding in demilitarizing. I said it before. Hamas had 24 battalions. They now have six now, that doesn't mean everyone who was in those battalions, those 18 battalions, has been killed or captured. They have not been. But what has happened is they're no longer part of an organized military unit. There's no longer any command control. Uh, they're no longer part of a larger group. They are, they're out there, maybe in small numbers, with their weapons still. It means they're still a problem, but they're no longer a military, they're a militia. Now, you still have six battalions that are left in Rafa uh, and in central Gaza. So you have to deal with that. But what I was saying before, if Israel defines the objective as the demilitarization of Gaza and the administration works out with Israel, what's a definition of how much is enough to demilitarize? So you can guarantee it can't be remilitarized. That will require a series of follow-on steps. Not necessarily by the Israelis, by the way. But once you get to that point, then at a minimum you can be in what, what the Israelis call phase four of the military campaign, which is you withdraw from Gaza. You keep a narrow buffer along the, where the kibbutzim are. 
but you withdraw from Gaza. Uh, and, and then if, if, as needed, you, know, you can have raids going back in, a little bit like what you're doing in the West Bank right now. What's different in the West Bank is you still have a Palestinian Authority. And by the way, while the Palestinian Authority is not acting in the refugee camps, they actually are acting every place else right now. If you talk to the Israeli military, they'll tell you they're actually acting everywhere else. Uh, probably at some cost to them, too. But that's, it tells you you need, when I was in Israel, since I'm on a roll, I'll say this. Um, I was sitting, I mean, I was talking to people who were ostensibly working on the on day after strategies. The problem is because of the politics of the coalition and because Ben Gavir and Smotrich were against it, these were all sort of informal efforts underway. Uh, but so I'm talking to them and, you know, and the public posture is Palestinian Authority can't come back. So I said, okay, so let's, walk, let's look at your options, okay? Option one is you get to stay in Gaza, which means you get to manage 2.3 million Palestinians. Um, I don't see too many people in Israel raising their hands saying, gee, that's a good idea. So the agreement was, yeah, that's not an option. Option two, I said, is that you get the Arabs to do it. Now, I don't see too many Arabs standing up and volunteering, but no one is going to volunteer and go in there, and I'm not even sure it's in your interest if you're still there or you keep going in, because what if you end up you know, getting into a conflict with them? So that's not an option. A third option is you basically rely upon the UN and UNRWA. Well, we know that's a passport to having Hamas come back. A fourth option is nobody. You just leave a vacuum. And that's Mogadishu. That's Somalia. And then you have 500,000 coming to your border clamoring to get in. And so that's not really an option. So guess what? It leads you back to. It leads you back to you're going to have to have the Palestinians doing it. Now, it can't be the Palestinian Authority up front because it's too corrupt, it's too, its governance is too terrible. There has to be, I call it a period, you have to have a, a kind of interim interim. Now, there are about 40,000 Palestinians who are part of a bureaucratic structure that was created by the Palestinian Authority and then was carried on by Hamas. These were not political people. These were the people who basically were responsible for water, electricity, managing the day-to-day -day realities of life. There's about 40,000 of them. There are, there's a community of Palestinian business people in Gaza, some of whom I've known over the years. There are Palestinian, Palestinian business people from the outside. We, I've been proposing, and I'm still waiting for it to happen, uh, we should create an international humanitarian board. The Gulf states say they will not pay for reconstruction unless they have a political horizon and an end game of Palestinian state. And the problem with that is I've already gone through. You, you know, maybe if it's a real distant horizon, but the fact is you can't have a Palestinian state without creating a series of benchmarks that will take time, A, to be carried out, and B, to be believable. So you can still bring them into a humanitarian board because they'll pay for humanitarian relief. You have 1.3 million Palestinians now. 85% of the population of Gaza has been displaced. 1.3 million are in Rafah, which is a very small, concentrated area. Israel wants to go into Rafah. The president has said, uh, we get that there's four battalions there, but you can't go in where you've got 1.3 million people who are there. Uh, so that you have to create an evacuation plan. But an evacuation plan that has people going to a place where there's no shelter, no food, no water, no medicine, is not an evacuation plan. So if you create a humanitarian board that has the Gulf states on it who can pay for prefab housing, they will do this. And then you create a relationship between them and this Palestinian administration that begins to emerge from the ground up. And you build a kind of rolling set of areas within Gaza that begin to look different. Now you have to provide security. And I think one way to do that is to hire security contractors. Uh, what people don't know right now, the UAE is an example. 
The UAE runs a field hospital in Gaza in full coordination with Israel. They provide their own security for the field hospital. They have just moved in five automated bakeries that can feed 420,000 people a day. They provide their own security. This is the UAE. So you're already seeing their readiness to do, take humanitarian steps. If you bring the Gulf states into this humanitarian board, you have them playing a role under a humanitarian rubric. But it begins a process of creating greater inclusion and involvement for them. And you can begin to build on that. And that's one of the things that I think begins to move us in a very different direction. Well, I have roughly 100,000 more questions. And uh, I also want to say this is the most hopeful I've been. Forget about since October 7th. I was in Israel uh, in 2000, the start of the Second Intifada. Then I'm going to turn it over to Rob, who's got your questions. doesn't work, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you, everyone, for the, uh, for the questions. I think you need to be a diplomat to, to, get, through, um, to get through this. But let's start with, um, so there's a report that the United States will be building a temporary port in Gaza yeah. to receive food and med, uh, medical aid. Yeah. Is it true? Were the Israelis asked about this? And how will the support be secured to make certain that new weapons do not enter into Gaza? So, look, this has been discussed, I can tell you, for at least about the last two months. I can even tell you that there were, within the IDF, whatever the stories are that were coming out now, within the IDF, I talked to a very senior general in the IDF who was raising this with me six weeks ago, that this was an answer to what needed to be done over time. Uh, so was it discussed with the Israelis? Yes. Uh, but the Israelis, in a sense, weren't acting on it. And I think the debacle of last week, when you, know, you have about 300,000 people in the northern part of the country, what actually happened was that the Israelis were running a kind of pilot project. Uh, and they were just working with businessmen, but there was nothing done to secure this. For three days, these trucks that, was, that were basically rented by a Palestinian businessman to distribute the food in the north, this was going on, but more people became aware of it, and literally there is starvation up there. So you had thousands of people descend at four in the morning on these trucks. It created a panic. Some moved towards the Israelis. They opened fire, and you had about 100 people killed. Uh, so this was a kind of reminder that as part of the question, A, this has been around for a while, B, this is a way to move dramatically more into Gaza from the north, and it's, it's, it's a kind of extended pier that we will build. The question of providing security is a critical one. There has to be, that's why I say you need, at a minimum, you need to have, you know, Blackwater has a bad name, uh, but the fact is there are contractors out there who don't have a bad name, uh, who do this. And by the way, they can also hire local Palestinians uh, as part of this. So there will have to be security connected to it. It will take a little while to be able to produce this extended pier. Uh, how will it be screened? All of the material will, be, will, go, will go from Cyprus. You'll have basically what is, what is a maritime corridor. Everything will be inspected uh, in Cyprus, loaded on the ships, they'll go in, uh, and then you have to have, that's why the reason you have to have security is, one of the problems was when the Israelis began to allow humanitarian assistance to go in, they didn't do anything with regard to thinking about how it would be distributed. And they didn't do anything when Hamas showed up and, with guns and started diverting it. So, you know, it was, it was not enough to sort of, okay, you're asking us to do humanitarian assistance. They didn't think about the follow-on step. You know, there has to be, a, a lot of what we've seen, by the way, is a complete lack of planning. Uh, and uh, it reflects the 
in a sense, uh, how much Israel was, in a sense, put on the back foot. It was completely surprised. They didn't plan for any of this. Uh, the assumptions were the threats were in the north or in the West Bank, which is where all the forces were. Almost nobody was in the south. Uh, and, and there wasn't a military plan either for what to do because they didn't anticipate this is what they would have to do. Now, having said what I just said, on the military front, what we've seen, once again, is exactly what we've always seen with the Israeli military, an unbelievable capacity to adjust, to innovate, to create in the worst possible circumstances. In 1973, in, in the Yom Kippur War, uh, the Israelis were surprised, not only by, by the attack, but also by the tactics. They were surprised by the use of anti-tank missiles. They were surprised by the surface-air missiles. Israel lost 800 tanks the first week uh, of the war. They lost one-third of their air force the first week of the war. And yet they turned the war completely around. They adjusted as, it was like the equivalent of flying a plane with one wing. But they, they adjusted. Same thing has happened here. They had no real plans for how to deal with the tunnels. But they've now come up with one in the midst of the war. So they are succeeding militarily. What I've been trying to get at is you can succeed militarily and lose politically. Given the cost, you can't afford to lose politically. So you have to have an objective that lends itself to winning, not just militarily, but politically. That's what I mean by demilitarization and then creating. Okay, here's a level of demilitarization. It has to stay this way. Now, what's the structure that's going to prevent material from being diverted? What's the structure that's going to prevent uh, the Egyptian Gazan border from being used to, to smuggle in? Uh, reconstruction, no, one's going to, no one is going to invest in it unless it's very clear that Hamas is not running Gaza. Because if they are, we know what they'll do. So all this, that's what the focus should be right now so that the result of this is actually a political win and a reality that Hamas has been defeated in a way that's unmistakable. You know, I was talking to a senior Arab official uh, and his observation was, you know, this would be the first time that one of Iran's uh, proxies has been defeated. But we're not that far from it as long as you don't allow them to be rescued because you don't have the right political approach afterwards. Great. <clears throat> um, so there, there are a bunch of questions uh, that deal with uh, the Arab attitude towards uh, Jews. So, yeah. um, so when, when you are negotiating uh, the various <clears throat> deals, um, were you able to get a sense of whether this is about Arab nationalism or the non-negotiable ideology of eradicating the Jews? If, if you're looking for an answer that says there's no one who believes in the Arab world that this is about the Jews, uh, you've come to the wrong place. But if you're asking, is that a collective attitude, no. Is there a segment of opinion that reflects that? Absolutely. And is there a desire on the part of a majority? Why should we, like in the UAE, why should we deny ourselves what's in our interest when the Palestinians have a leadership that will never do anything to solve their own problems or help themselves? Why should we be held hostage to their inability to ever pursue their own interests? And there was a sense, okay, we, we're done. Now, what was driving the Saudi move towards normalization with Israel was their desire for a defense treaty with us. That's a fact. But there was also an understanding, just like with the UAE, you look around the region, and what originally created a convergence between Israel and a number of Arab states was a common sense of threat perception coming from Iran and the proxies. Okay, that didn't disappear, but something began to supplant it. Because if, it was, you know, if that was the only driver, you wouldn't have had the Abraham Accords. 
because all the kind of military cooperation and intelligence cooperation is kind of below the surface. You don't see it. But they wanted something different because they understand what are the challenges in the 21st century, especially in the Middle East because of climate change. You know, droughts are a typical function of the reality there. You know, temperatures there in the summer, not even the non-summer, like 130 degrees. Increasingly, these are places, there are places there that are simply not livable. So dealing with that, that's a fundamental need. There's a need for water security. Related to that is food security. Uh, who's the leader on water in the world? Israel. Literally, whether you're talking about drip irrigation, or you're talking about conservation, or you're drawing water out of the humidity in the atmosphere, which my son, when I told him about it, and he, he made Aliyah to Israel, he asked me what I was smoking. I said, no, it's for real. There's a company in Israel called WaterGen that does that. It actually extracts the, from the humidity in the air, it creates drinking water. The, you look at Ben-Gurion University, uh, and they have created, created drought-resistant crops. So you have these countries and regions who are looking at Israel, the startup nation, they say, wow, water security, food security, health security, cyber security. Who's cutting edge? Israel. And they want that. These, especially in the Gulf states, there is this desire to build resilient societies. These are not democracies. On the other hand, they are quite open socially, and especially the UAE is quite open religiously and tolerantly. They have an Abrahamic center where you have a synagogue, a mosque, and a church. Uh, there actually is a, an interesting Jewish community in the UAE now. Uh, so there's a kind of, uh, there is a recognition that they need good governance and delivery of services. And to cope with what are the challenges that are coming, they see Israel as a natural partner. So that's the good news in all of this. What they also have discovered because of October 7th and its aftermath now they thought they could ignore the Palestinian issue, and now they know they can't. Do they have a specific answer for it? They say the Palestinian state is kind of a catch-all. So that's why I'm trying to introduce with them, okay, I too believe in the end you need that, but this has to be a state that is going to be a contributor to what you want to see in the region, not a threat to it. Um. Okay, so as it relates to the day <coughs> after, um, I've heard you talk a lot about power vacuums and that being a, a considerable concern for you. Um, so how do we get to um, the day after without leaving significant power vacuums? I mean, this is kind of the... I mean, I'm old enough to say, I remember when there was a $64,000 question on TV, so. Um, look, this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good lunch, though. It's, uh, um, what I was trying to lay out is a, is a pathway to it. You know, one of the things I was saying early on when I was in Israel and also to our administration, stop talking about the day after. Start talking about the days and months before you get to the day after. What do we have to create between now and then to get there? What I was describing a little earlier was, okay, build these pilot projects, these areas, starting in the north. Where, where this pier is going to be? Where are you going to be able to move a lot of material in? Start in the north. First of all, you have to evacuate the people from Rafa there. Start there. But you have to create law and order. You have to provide security for the distribution. You know, the more you can do, the more you, you know, the old saying, there's nothing that succeeds like success. If you are showing that life is emerging again, and the life that's emerging again is 
done without Hamas, you're laying the predicate for what can happen throughout all of Gaza. Look, it's not that Hamas remains a threat because they still have people with guns. And even when the last six battalions are destroyed, you're still going to have people with guns there. So there have to be other people with guns, number one. But number two, and I was meeting with a very senior UN official who I've known for a long time. Uh, and he said to me, look, what we're seeing on the ground right now, he said, not everywhere, but we're seeing when Hamas emerges, we're seeing people throw stones at them. You know, to think that everybody in Gaza is, is thrilled with their current reality, I said 85% of the population is displaced. They're living in, in almost an incomprehensible existence right now. Are they mad at the Israelis? Of course. But you think they're so thrilled with Hamas, who put them in this position? By the way, so uh, I know several people in Gaza who, fortunately, one has finally gotten out. But I was in touch with this person. Uh, and this person was describing how, you know, how tenuous things were, how threatening they were, how difficult it was, and then said uh, to me, but of course, the Hamas guys, they're all in the tunnels. We can't be in the tunnels, but they're all in the tunnels. I'll just say this wasn't said in a uh, jovial, supportive fashion. So to think that the people there, you know, are somehow indifferent to the circumstance and who put them in the circumstance is to ignore it. I don't mean to say there aren't people who you know, have been socialized. You know, they have been, they've had a very active socialization process starting with kids who are as young as two and three. So yeah, I'm, I have no doubt there's a part of this population that believes in the ideology. But there's a lot of people in that population who would just like to be able to have some relief and to have a normal life and to have some future. And the one thing they know, there is no possibility of that if Hamas comes back. Okay, <clears throat> we have time for two more questions. Um, the, the, there are a lot of questions uh, that are political you can, in You nature. can ask me as I walk out, okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you can ask as I walk out. Would you like to ask a question? She would like to ask a question. Sure. I heard Noi Levin, if I'm saying it right, at the... Old Westbury Hebrew congregation last night, he's been in Gaza five times. He's a paratrooper. And he's traveling all over now to try to explain Israel's position. He said he's really, he was great, because I'm listening to you. He said he went into all the buildings, the apartments, you know, they're looking for weapons and yeah. everything. He said one apartment he went into, he's in a room, he said he felt funny going through little girl pajamas and things like yeah. that. Couldn't be older than five. Yeah. He said there wasn't, and he was all over, he's been there five times. There wasn't one place that he went to, including that little girl's room, that, he didn't eat, that they didn't find either weapons of some kind. That little girl's room, he sees a poster. He said maybe she has some kind of celebrity, Taylor Swift. It was Sinwa in her room. He said he changed his feelings. When you talk about you know, the people there and want to be helpful, I, I keep hearing what he said. There wasn't one place, and he was all over in Gaza, not one apartment, that look, he I, didn't seem something. Look, I, I said, I, I suspect there's a significant part of the population that has supported Hamas. But how do you explain that when these guys emerge, there are people throwing stones at them. How do you explain that? I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing, by the way, to go into all these places. These places existed before the Israelis were there, right? Now, 70% of all the buildings in the northern part of Gaza have been destroyed or are un uninhabitable. So you think people have been unaffected by that? You know, it, you have people who, uh, 
literally are, have been moved four or five times. There's a lot of unexploded ordnance around. Uh, you know, they're living in, uh, in places where there's almost no sense of security. They have limited access to food. They have very limited access to toilets. I mean, this is an impossible endurance. You think that they're not aware of where Hamas is and how it's been operating? Look, I, I would not make the claim that they wouldn't be mad at Israel. Okay? No way would I make that claim. There's no doubt. People will say, look, this is what the Israelis are doing to us. For sure. But, you think Hamas comes back? There's any possibility of a future? You think they think that there's any possibility of a future if Hamas comes back? You know, you don't need the entire population. You need a significant part of the population that has to adopt the position that they want something different. You know, I will give you an example that tells me again that there's more potential than one might think. Now, this is before October 7th. Uh, go to YouTube and look up Whispers in Gaza. This is a video. Uh, interviews with 24 different Palestinians in Gaza. It's animated and the voices are disguised because of what Hamas does to anybody who is a critic. Uh, and these 24 are completely from very different walks of life, completely different walks of life. And they describe what life is like under Hamas. Uh, and it's, it's a consistent critique of what it means to have to live under Hamas. That got 750,000 views in Gaza. So what does that tell you? It tells you that not everybody there believes in Hamas. Okay, so last question. A <clears throat> um, lot of questions about uh, how our administration is doing, um, but maybe we can focus it a little bit on what the U.S. government should be doing in this situation. First, as I said, I mean, look, I, I'm not sure that anybody else as president would have done what Biden has done. First of all, he's the first president ever to go to Israel during a war. It's pretty hard to imagine. We've never had an American president go there during wartime. Uh, but he did. Uh, and, and he called this what it was right from the beginning. Now, is he, has he become increasingly concerned about the humanitarian situation? Yes. And I, my view is that's legitimate. Uh, what I would like to see the administration doing that it's not, the administration... I have an article that will be out in Foreign Affairs, I think, tomorrow, where I sort of call for a kind of whole-of-government effort the way it was done on Ukraine. What I mean by that is the following. Before Putin went in and then after, the U.S. mobilized uh, a collective response, uh, a collective approach on sanctions. We mobilized. Others were prepared to follow suit, but we're the ones who organized it and mobilized it a collective response on sanctions, uh, an approach to compensate for, uh, for not buying Russian natural gas and oil, uh, an approach to create a logistics hub to organize all the weapons going into Ukraine, uh, and a, a changing the, the redeployments uh, in NATO, including not only our own, getting others to do forward deployments up to the border, closer to Russia. Uh, a organization and mobilization of assistance, now, not, not military assistance, but economic assistance to Ukraine. Uh, changing NATO itself and opening up for Sweden and, and Finland to join. None of this would have happened by itself. And what I'm saying is the same kind of effort needs to be done now. When I say a humanitarian board, someone has to organize it. Someone has to talk to everybody and make sure they're going to play a role and they're going to be on it. And then define what the agenda is, what it's going to do, what its first steps will be. 
we have to we have to broker an agreement between the Israelis and the Egyptians on what happens at Rafah, not as it relates to the four battalions, but what it relates to at some point. By the way, these four battalions, these may be among the least capable and the most corrupt of all the Hamas battalions because they were re responsible for all the smuggling. But there has to be that, that border between Egypt and Gaza, it has to be changed so that everything that Hamas got, it can no longer get. Or any successor to Hamas can no longer get. Uh, we have to coordinate the delivery of assistance and the security for it. We have to make sure there's reform in the PA by organizing again a collective approach to Abu Mazen and making it clear he doesn't have a choice in this matter. My point is, this doesn't happen by itself. The administration has to organize itself and make the same kind of all of government effort to do this. That's the one thing I, the, the substance of what the administration has done has been the right thing. I would like to see them do more and be more effective in terms of what they're doing so that we can create what I was describing these days before you get to the day after and then you have an approach for the day after that offers you something for the future. <clears throat> Fantastic. Um, okay, so just two, two things briefly. If, um, the first thing is uh, Rami Abada, who was speaking earlier, um, I want to thank you personally for everything that you've done. Um, the effort has been extraordinary. Uh, I certainly couldn't have been, uh, I was, would not have been, I would not have known what to do without you. So thank you uh, in, in a very appreciative way. I'm going to say one other thing and then I'm going to turn it back to the rabbi for the final word, if that's okay. Um, uh, the first part of it is, Ambassador, thank you so much for coming. Um, you, uh, you clearly have spoken uh, to people in a way where um, I think they leave with hope, which, uh, which is very encouraging. Um, the Ambassador's book, as I said, is for sale on the left-hand side. He's going to stay and sign the book um, and take pictures uh, with anybody who would like to. Um, those who were at the event at 7 o'clock, um, we have the books. Um, if you wouldn't mind getting up and going over to the table on the right, uh, my son Ben will direct you. Um, we'll start the book signing that way. <laughs> okay? Um, Rabbi? Well, I wish we could sit and talk for a much, much longer, but based on the rustling as I read the crowd, I think we might be getting to bedtime. Uh, I want to say thank you for a lot of reasons, but uh, there was one phrase I heard you say over and over again, which shows just how lucky we are here tonight to hear what you have to say. You said some version of, last week I was meeting with a senior Arab official. I was, well, last week I was sitting by myself in a room with COVID, but a week before that, I was meeting with preschool parents who are very important. Uh, most of our world does not get to get that first access. We are filtered through so many layers of algorithms trying to tell us what we already think. So more than anything, I just want to say thank you for your firsthand experience. Thank you for still going back. Thank you for believing in the Jewish state and the, the project of Zionism. And uh, like Rob said, I want to say thank you for giving us hope. I'm going to rise myself and say, let's stand up and say thank you so much to Ambassador Ross for joining us here. Tonight. Let the ambassador get to the back, like, you know, like at the holidays when we want to say, give you our handshakes. Thank you very much.